Is doing something that the Bible says is holy the same as repenting? Let's talk about Leviticus chapter 22 today. Hey, and welcome to The Whole Truth, where I am taking you through the entire Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, and we're not skipping anything. So if that sounds good to you, make sure to reach down and hit the little subscribe button below. That way, every time I'm putting out another video, you get notification of that. And then don't forget that there's a new website coming. It's going to be thewholetruthbiblestudy.com or pastorjustinwalker.com. Either one of those is going to lead you to the same place where I'm going to have all of those videos contained into one website. Uh, not to mention I'm trying to put up Bible studies and some other things as well. So make sure you go and visit that. For today, look at Leviticus chapter 22. In Leviticus chapter 22, we see that the priests are told that they cannot go anywhere near the things that are dedicated to the Lord, the holy things, if they themselves are unclean. How's that going to apply to us? Well, let's read it first in this Leviticus 22. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to to Aaron and his sons, that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and that they do not profane my holy name by what they dedicate to me. I am the Lord. Say to them, whoever of all your descendants throughout your generation who goes near the holy things which the children of Israel dedicate to the Lord while he has uncleanness upon him, that person shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. Whatever man of the descendants of Aaron who is a leper or who has a discharge shall not eat the holy offerings until he is clean. And whoever touches anything made unclean by a corpse or a man who has had an emission of semen or whoever touches any creeping thing by which he would be made unclean or any person by whom he would become unclean, whatever his uncleanness may be, the person who has touched any such thing shall be unclean until evening and shall not eat the holy offerings unless he washes his body with water. And when the sun goes down, he shall be clean. And afterward, he may eat the holy offerings because it is his food. Whatever dies naturally or is torn by beast, he shall not eat to defile himself with it. I am the Lord. They shall therefore keep my ordinance, lest they bear sin for it and die thereby, if they profane it. I, the Lord, sanctify them. No outsider shall eat the holy offering. One who dwells with the priest or a hired servant shall not eat the holy thing. But if the priest buys a person with his money, he may eat it. And one who is born in his house may eat his food. If the priest's daughter is married to an outsider, she may not eat the holy offerings. But if the priest's daughter is a widow or divorced and has no children or has no child, has returned to her father's house as in her youth, she may eat her father's food, but no outsider shall eat it. And if a man eats the holy offering unintentionally, then he shall restore a holy offering to the priest and add one-fifth to it. They shall not profane the holy offerings of the children of Israel, which they offer to the Lord, or allow them to bear the guilt of trespass when they eat their holy offerings, for I, the Lord, sanctify them. Okay, There's the text. The priests are not allowed to go anywhere near the holy offerings, the holy things. What are those things? That's going to be the 12 loaves of bread that are before the Lord in the tabernacle. And that's going to include all the offerings and all the sacrifices that are brought from the Israelite people. See, what God has said is this. This is the the custom of the way that God had ordained for the Israelite people. The Israelite people would bring their sacrifices to the tabernacle. That's a big tent. They would make their sacrifices, but the meat from those sacrifices, or at least some of them, some of the animals needed to be burned completely. And all of those are typologies of Christ. And I've got videos about all of those already. But some of those animals would not completely be burned. Some of the parts, some of the meat would be given to the priest 
as his portion. Sometimes people would bring grain as a grain offering. Sometimes people would bring wine as a drink offering. Sometimes people would bring animals for sin offerings or for atonement or for peace offerings. They would bring these things to the tabernacle and some of it would be burned on the altar, but some of it would be used for the priest. Here's the, here's the kicker. The priests are now being told if they themselves are unclean, and there's a list of ways that they're unclean, but then it goes on to say in any way, if you've done anything that would make you unclean, given by all the laws that, that God has already given, okay? So you can't touch anything that's dead. You can't have, there, there's no part of you that can have any part of anything unclean or touch anybody else who's been unclean. So that would mean like touch a corpse or somebody else who's touched a corpse. That would mean that if you've done that, that you're ceremonial, ceremonially unclean. And in that state, you cannot go and get the, the holy offerings and eat that as your food. Now, wait a second. What does that mean? Do they have to just starve if that's their food? Or are they just not allowed to eat at that point? Well, no, there, there was a, there's an expectation here that they would remain clean. And if they're not clean, then they would be, they would do the things that would make them clean, which is wash their body and wait until the evening. So they're supposed to go and wash and then they're supposed to, to wait until the evening. If they didn't do that and they went ahead and ate it anyways, then they would be in trouble because they didn't do things the way they were supposed to do them, which was to be clean first and then go for the holy things. Now, first of all, understand that as all things that deal with the priest, this is a typology of Christ. And it points to the fact that Jesus is completely clean. Even Jesus was so holy and so clean that even when unclean people came to him and touched him, they were made clean. You see, because Jesus is the offering, he's the spotless lamb, and he's also the high priest. And so if we want to come to God, we come to Jesus. So there's the typology. But what about the practical application? How is there practical application in this for us? And I think the answer is this. Doing something that we know is inherently holy, separated to God, is in and of itself not repentance. So let me give you a couple of examples. The first one I will give you is a very popular one. Baptism. I love baptism. I love seeing people dedicate themselves to the Lord. I love to see people identifying themselves with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection because that's what they're doing in, bapti in being baptized, dying with Christ and being risen to walk with him in a new life. That's a symbol of what's already happened. But you need to hear this. The waters of baptism do not make you clean. You do not go in the water and you're dirty and then go under and come back up and now all of a sudden you're clean. Because the holy thing, baptism, doesn't make you clean. We baptize somebody who's already been made clean. How have they been made clean? Justin, you, maybe you're asking me, Justin, wait a second. How is that person made clean? I thought going in the water and coming back up, I thought they were made clean. Or maybe you thought it was sprinkling. Maybe you thought that you had to be sprinkled or, or in some way with some sort of holy water and that would make you clean. But friends, that's not what makes you clean. The act of... The holy thing does not make you clean. What makes you clean is belief and faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, hopefully I took care of the barking dog. I'm back. All right, now, here's what we're, here's what we're talking. Maybe you didn't even hear the dog, but he was right out the window barking. Okay, so here's what we're talking about. That Jesus has made you clean, not the, not the action of baptism. I'll give you another example. Now, this example, be ready. I hope you're ready, but remember... I'm a pastor and the, and the goal for me is to speak the truth. I want to do that in love and I want to do that mercifully, but, but you need to hear the truth too. And here's something that continually happens. Now, if this has happened with you, if you're watching this video and you go, Justin, you're talking about me, know that this has happened to me at least a dozen times, that a young couple will come to me and they want me to do their wedding. And then it, it's, it comes to light that they're living together. And I always tell the young couple that is living together, or even the older couple, even though it's never happened with an older couple with me yet, but with younger couples, it always happens 
that they want me to do the wedding and they're living together. And I always tell them that I can't do their wedding if they're living together. And the reason I can't do their wedding if they're living together is because, well, they're living in sin. If you're living with somebody that is not your spouse, you're, you've broken the right order. You're not doing it in the right order. And then the young couple always wants to look at me. Now, remember what we're talking about is doing something holy. Is that the same as repentance? Now, listen, young people, they say to me, they'll go, well, wait a second. That doesn't make sense. If you want us to be married, why wouldn't you do the wedding if we're living together? And I always tell them this, because marriage is not repentance. Your marriage vows are not repentance. If you come to me and you say, Justin, will you do my wedding and you're living together? I'll always give you the option and I'll say this that you can separate, you can stop living together in some way, stop living together. How do you do it? Do you have to move in with a friend or move back in with your parents? That's the repentance. And, and the young couple always says to me, yeah, but, but once we're married, then we're not in sin anymore, right? Well, sure, you're, you're not living in sin anymore, but you're holding on to an, to an old thing. You see, repentance, sometimes repentance is hard. We've done something we shouldn't do. That's what I'm always told. How am I going to do? I can't move back in with my parents. I can't, I don't have anywhere to go or this or that. Well, listen, repentance is, can be a hard thing sometimes because we got to turn away from what we've been doing. You see, repentance is not, it doesn't happen because we did some holy thing. Matrimony, marriage is a holy thing separated by God. But that in and of itself is not the repentance. Like that does, that might be that you're now no longer living with somebody who's not your spouse, but the entire time you were planning that wedding, you were continuing, you were planning to do something holy, but you were living in sin while you were doing it. And that's why I always tell these young couples that they need to separate until the time of their marriage. That's the repentance. Because what we want, what we're seeking, I sit in these premarital counseling sessions with these young people, with these young couples, and I try to express to them what you want is that God bless your marriage. You want God to be in all parts of your marriage, even the parts that are leading up to it. Now, am I in any way saying that God's going to somehow curse you or cut you off if you've lived together with somebody that's not your spouse? Friends, listen, there's forgiveness in Christ. That's the whole point. That's the last thing I want to get to today, which is this. I love the beauty in seeing that God always makes provisions for us who he knows we're sinners. God made a provision for the priest and for anybody else too. He even said if there was somebody that came in the priest's house, that was they were real people. They really had houses and they had friends. And if a friend came in their house and unknowingly made himself a, a roast beef sandwich with bread and, and meat that was used for the offering, even that man, he could pay it back. He shouldn't do that. That's wrong. And that was a dedicated and holy thing to the Lord. But even the stranger who came in the priest's house who did that, he could make restitution for the priest who, um, who's been made unclean. It's not that there's nothing for him. It's that he needs to be made clean. It's not that he can't ever eat anything again or he's just kicked out. No, it says if he's made unclean, he needs to be made clean. And he would do that by washing himself and then waiting until the evening. And that's the truth for you and I as well. We have sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. But here's the truth. The gift of God is eternal life for those of us who put our faith and our trust in him. Will you do that? Will you put your faith and your trust in Jesus? Trust that he will make you clean. And then we do holy things like get baptized. Do you see the difference? I hope that you do. And I hope that you've got your trust in Jesus. Jesus who will make you clean. That's the right order. I don't do something to be made clean. I trust in the one who makes me clean. It's him. I go to my high priest, which is Jesus. He makes me clean. And then, and then I'm made right to do holy things in his name. All right, I hope you enjoyed today's video and I hope you'll come back tomorrow as we dig a little deeper into Leviticus chapter 22. I'll see you then.